friends, come along with me, see how the story ends, we are some hippies, these are my friends, come along with me, see how the story ends. Honey, <laughs> where's my super suit? Welcome back to another episode of Professional Hippies. <laughs> If you've been long in the ride, man, we love you guys. We haven't checked the analytics in a while, right? I wonder if we got any uh, well, I mean, any new listeners. And the, you haven't checked the analytics in a while. <laughs> Can I finish my thoughts, man? I just feel like between the voices in my head and the voices in my ears, I can't ever get out what I'm trying to express. Well, I wonder I if we have any new listeners. Oh, Jesus Christ, God Almighty. You know, between the cats, the dog, and you, I got a lot of going on in this life. It ain't much, um, I'll tell you that. But it's an honest cat. living. <laughs> What's up, Jelly Bean? If uh, you guys have been following along with us, we are eternally grateful for you. And if you haven't, hey, we're the professional hippies. We like to bridge the gap between the hippie woo-woo and the professional go-getters. And so today, we're going to cover a range of topics, kind of befitting for our, uh, I don't know, theme, whatever you want to explore there. But... Um, yeah, man, for me, you know what I've been digging into lately that's just been real juicy? Pecan pies. I do like, you know, I, I really prefer the pecan pies that have like a little bit of apple in there as well. You ever had like an apple crisp oh, yeah. pecan pie? A little apple, apple pie, throw in some pecans in there. Oh, yeah. Here's the funny part. I don't really care for pecan pie. Is it pecan or pecan? Depends on what side you're on, the right side or the wrong side. Amen, brother. I don't really care for uh, my aunt, my auntie, or my aunt uh, pie alone. And I don't exclusively jive with apple pie itself. But together, the sweet marriage of flavors in my mouth is delectable. <laughs> it's undeniable. It's the flavor spread that daddy needs. I don't think you've ever had a good apple pie then, because there is some. I have. I mean, pie out dude, there. for sure, I've gotten down on some apple jam. You had before. to. I mean, you're you're just an hour south of Alabama when you grew up. Was it that so, place we stopped at in Tennessee? That biscuit place? Weren't we going to Tennessee or something? A diner, and they had. Like, oh yeah, where Luke asks about is your catfish fresh, and she's like, no, it's it's frozen. It comes from. <laughs> no, 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 no. I'm, I'm thinking a different place. This place was known for their biscuits. That was like a hole in the wall. I believe that was when we saw a man in a full Trump suit. No, it, was it wasn't like, a full. It wasn't a full Trump suit. It was a full uh, rebel flag cowboy outfit, like vest, cowboy. I, I mean, uh, rebel flag pants, rebel flag cowboy hat, rebel flag. Common misconception. Common. Common misconception. Which, speaking of, have you seen all the shit coming out from like, uh, was the, when did the Capitol riot thing? January 6th, whatever. Yes. Yeah. Have you have you been keeping up with any of that stuff? Have you seen any of that stuff that's coming out about that? No, I've been keeping up with all the other bullshit that's been coming out. <laughs> like what? Around like the justices or what do you mean? Like them starting to hate. Hammer Nancy Pelosi a little bit harder, like how she keeps getting richer and she keeps doing trading in stocks before bills are put up to that to the house. Oh, there was a clip the other day of her uh, where like she got asked away. about her husband and yeah, she, was, she like, was like, "I don't know what you're not. talking about." And it's just like, interviews <laughs> over. <laughs> yeah. There's a guy. There's a couple guys I follow that like their trading is they just mirror her investment strategy. Cause it's oh disclosed. yeah, There's, you can watch it. It's it's public information. You can just watch it, follow it, and get as rich as she is. Well, I wonder, like, how effective. I mean, you can't imagine that with the backdoor trading, she's doing bad. But like, how does her, her stock picks perform next to, say, like a you know hedge fund manager, financial accountant? Well, imagine if you knew the answers that were coming, and comparative to not having the answers. I'm curious on like the last five, 10 year performance, you know, I mean, like I'm, I'm sure some great. of those guys could pull up. That's why she's known for like, that's, you can look at her chart. Boop, 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 boop. It's like, Would you have enough confidence though, to put some eggs in that basket? Well, yeah, because her, 
her husband is literally a hedge fund manager. Is he? Yeah, that's what he does. That's he Them is a financial bastards. hedge fund analyst manager. Like that's what. Oh my gosh! Does. So she, he he when it's Nancy Pelosi, it's not her trading; it's her husband trading. But she can legally do that because it's him trading mm. the account. She just tells him what's going on, and then boop. So think of all those clients he has. How long have they been married? Do you think? Probably a long time. They're both. Probably a while. But the, get, the politicians did, tend to stay together, don't they? He did get a DUI, though, not too long ago. Leaving some some event, I think. Was it Bonnaroo? It, I, don't hold me to it. There was a politician that got a uh, DUI leaving Bonnaroo over the summer. I don't That's think impressive, it was That's impressive, by the way. But That's impressive. Was, You're leaving at an hour you shouldn't leave. You're leaving early. Oh, yeah. You should not be leaving. You're getting stung, buddy. You ain't trying to beat the traffic. You're just over it, and if, that's your punishment. If you're leaving Bonnaroo, you better be stoned. So, because all the, co- I mean, all it is is a pack of wolves just sitting outside the festival waiting. And these pack of wolves have these little lights on them, and they got mm. this thing called tickets and handcuffs that they can just. Bow. I hate it when they arm the wolves with lights and handcuffs. Man, that Me is too. just dangerous. It's dangerous, but that's all they're doing. They're just sitting outside the den waiting for you. Every year, too, with without fail, when yeah. you're coming in, you just see a graveyard next to the highway of these poor kids getting their dreams and lives crushed. Like those people we went to Walmart with, yeah. <laughs> literally check out in front of us, and we see them not even five minutes later. And the you could see the Over. face. You could see the face. We have all the drugs we're going to consume all for the weekend in the center console. The road. All their stuff is on the road. But I bet they were like smoking weed in the festival you know they've got tie-dye shirts on stuff like that you can't look like you're going to bonnaroo when you're going to bonnaroo it's real tough to look like you're not going to bonnaroo at the same time as well though because the cops know what to look for and at the same time like it's you just don't you don't want to play it out right you want to look like a camper not a fucking fast head i mean if you got that coexist sticker on the back you got smoke coming out the the driver's side window your car's packed that person's probably going to bonnaroo you know, but if they're like, hey, where are you going? And they're like, I swear. See, every time we have gone to Bonnaroo, I've actually studied local campsites around that area, like national parks and stuff. So if we get pulled over, he's like, where are you going? And I'm like, I have a campsite, reservation, whatever. It, like, it gets dark at this time. We're trying to make it there. Yeah. Because like, then I got a whole bunch of camping equipment, <laughs> you know. What, what does it look like I'm doing? We can search me for, sir. Catfish yeah. fillets? I'm sorry. I don't I, think so. Trying to make it there. I'm just trying to get where I'm going, dog. Just let me be free. Hey, um, in other news, I didn't get a chance to check out the article. Article didn't get to dig too deep into it, but um, coming up soon on the ballot for Denver, full decrim not decrim uh, legalization of mushrooms. Interesting. So right now that it's decriminalized. But there is a push for full-on legalization. Mm. Which, and I looked at it and I was like, so how does that work? But cannabis is a Schedule One substance, correct? Yes. Yeah. It, it Keep is. Talking. Yeah. Keep talking. So, so. Um, sorry, Jelly Bean's making this tough. If you don't know Jelly Bean, he's our official, unofficial mascot. Um, yeah, so... There is kind of like yeah. mixed support on whether or not that's the right right route to go, even by like the people that are pro. Um, Jelly bean, why is, you, why is that though? Really tough, dude. Um, well, I, I think it has a lot to do with like the path to legalization. So there's kind of like this concept from I was introduced from Hamilton Morris, you know, the guy from uh, Hamilton's Pharmacopia on Vice. Yes. And so but like when alcohol was outlawed, hey, you got this big movement, like clearly it's going to be done regardless. It's clear war on drugs, totally failed operation. Right? So it's still happening in the way that I think we've even discussed this. The way they tried to legitimize alcohol was through like prescription, like the doctor route, the doctor frame. 
So taking like a medicinal approach towards legalization, but then there was such, such mainstream support. People just wanted to drown their sorrows. They're like, fuck it. We can't, we can't resist this support. So when the original, um, bill makers for cannabis were trying to figure out a way to like worm this in, they went for the medicinal approach. Like, Oh, Hey, there's a lot of support that we can give for people suffering from depression, anxiety, you know, pain relief, et cetera. And so the, um, psychopharmacologists that were helping lawmakers put in, introduce bills into legislation for psychedelics are kind of stealing that playbook as well. Mm-hmm. So that, if anything, I would assume, again, I didn't do the research on the article would be the resistance is that if we go full on legalization, right? Not decriminalization, but legalization, this opens up. Have you seen the, how to open your mind on Netflix? Uh, no, I'm going to watch that here soon, though. Super good. I've super heard that's good. good. Yeah, wanna, super good. I want to watch it uh, with Christy. So. so this doctor called Timothy Leary just totally fucked up. the. His belief was like, hey, acid should be in the drinking water of America. He was kind of the one that spearheaded the resistance yeah. towards Vietnam. Yeah. And that is also what um, cannibalized the movement of LSD and other psychedelics was because of the resistance towards the war. Yeah. And so like, oh, we got to crush this. So that's when, you know, a lot of that upheaval happened. So that's kind of the same thing that's happening here is that you got a lot of guys that are like going to die on the sword of the door in for legalization is through the medicinal route. And then yeah. you got other guys like Hamilton Morris and I align with him. It's like, hey, I'm a fucking adult. Like, as long as I'm not ruining someone else's time, just let me be me. If I'm not hurting myself, if I'm not hurting sure. anybody else, let me be me. So you got this kind of, those two tribes. I feel like not going sure. that route, though, just let me be me, it allows, it doesn't allow the opportunity for the other side to understand the benefits of it. Like, you have to go, th- going through the medicinal route allows an approach of showing the other side there's advantages to this, not only therapeutically, you know, from a recreational purpose, but also it really does help people. Yeah. You know, on a, on a, on a daily basis when they need it, like uh, PTSD, schizophrenia, things like that. You know, funny enough though, I mean, on the other side of that, what I actually made a connection of watching the, how to open your mind the other day was uh, one of the things the guy, Michael Pollan, is the one that the series is based off his work, the book, uh, How to Open Your Mind, Your Mind on Plants, and a couple other pieces. I totally realized a mutual friend of ours, more mine than yours, I totally did introduce a psychotic break into his life. And, and that is one of the, uh, one of the underlying dangers that they, they outline with that. It's a common theme with you. I wish, you know, if we could just take a moment of silence. <laughs> so, um, but in all fairness, there's, there's not really, aside from maybe doing really intensive blood work in a much better set and setting, there, there was no real obvious signs pointing to that. And that psychotic break may have been facilitated at the moment of that music festival, but the symptoms didn't really come to play for quite a while after. So maybe, maybe part of it's just me kind of like burdening some guilt that isn't, you know, really fair. But at, at the other time, like I really have looked back on that time because I've introduced so many people to psychedelics that. I would say the I'm first like, time I was introduced to it, I had a little bit of a psychotic break. The first time I was introduced to it, but I was just because I, it, we just did it wrong. Like it, we didn't, it wasn't set in setting. There was no prep. The person that introduced me to it just they didn't know how to prep for it, you know? So it was just, I had to go through a lot of like mental bullshit after it and then figured it out afterwards. But I definitely know where that person's probably coming from for sure. Yeah. I mean, I've, I've certainly experienced a psychotic break before, I, but I don't know if that's the right way to frame it, but definitely a bad trip. Right. Yeah. My first and one if was, someone, yeah. if someone would have framed psychedelics a little bit more appropriately for me going into it, it's not about, always butterflies and rainbows 
sometimes the beauty is being broken down to being built back up again. Well, I think that's where a lot of people actually learn the benefit from from it is when they do have one of those breaking points. Because uh, I, I don't remember who was talking about it, but they kept saying, they kept said a lot of first timers, they'll do it, right? Usually it's some younger person. And then after they do it, and they keep having these good trips, they think like everybody should do it. Right. So they become an evangelist that yeah. I mean, they'll go to their parents, their family, their grandma, everybody should do it. But then they'll have a bad, a bad trip. And usually what I have learned, it's either a trip that something triggered it, a, a bad trip. I have found now that I kind of understand it better is the, let's call it medicine is putting something to you that you have pushed off to the side long enough. And now it's bringing it to your attention. And because you've put it to the side long enough, you don't know how to handle this yet. Mm. And it's bringing it to the top. And then when you're trying to push it to the side, you start getting into a thought loop, trying to get it. And it keeps pushing it right back up to solve it. And all of a sudden it becomes a trip because you're not, you've had such good trips up to this point because you haven't been forced to deal with something yet. Yeah. So now you're being forced to deal with it and you don't know how to handle it. And now that's a, once you do, you either handle it or you come out of it, not handling it, wondering what just happened. And then over time you realized, Oh, I didn't, I need to figure out this problem that's being pushed before I can get back into doing that. And so that, that's kind of what I've, I've learned that a lot of times people get into the bad trips from, and they just and then yeah. once that happens, they start bec- they stop becoming evangelists because then they realize, oh, this isn't for everybody. This is something that is a it definitely is a medicine, and I'm using it recreationally. Well, in that same frame, think about love. Think about the first time you fall in love. You're yeah. like, wow, life is so beautiful. It's more rich. It's it's fulfilling, et cetera, et cetera. Then you get your heart broken, right? There's a certain part of you that is born in that break that otherwise wouldn't exist. And so it's like, if you only had the love, of course you want everybody to experience love. Or another frame that popped up for me is, in that break, for me, what those loops, those presentations of ego, those thoughts that have been suppressed and repressed over time and just calcifying, what certain trips have done, it's like there's a, there's like a, I have a hand on a hot stove. And I'm just not looking at it. I'll smell the fumes, right? And I'll know that, hey, something's not right. But I, I, I will choose not to look at the hand. And psychedelics like really put that at the forefront. It's like, hey, you know this is going on. You have to work through this. You can choose not to, but it typically makes for a bad time, right? Yeah. And so you look at that hand and the way that you handle that. So you can take the hand off and you go, hey, I need to give medicine to this hand. I'm going to bandage it up. Probably going to be good. Or you can just have a full on fucking break and just be like, oh my God, my hand's on fire or whatever. And, and it's just not going to heal the same. It's going to create some scarring. Mm-hmm. Right? Yeah. I mean, that, that's the way, you know, those are some of the frames that come up for me when I think about that. But in, in regardless, I mean, this kind of like we talked about in a, in a previous episode, maybe the Ten Commandments, you know, the difference between recreation and intention. Mm-hmm. It's like you, you can just blow off a lot of steam. You don't have to do anything about the loops, love, hand, evangelizing, whatever. You can just have a bunch of fan, a bunch of fun with it and kind of whatever. And like festivals are a great setting for that. I think a lot but, of those bad trips come more to when you don't like a festival, right? You have a lot of outward uh, simulation. Know, thank you. Outward simulation to distract you from what's going on. Right. But if you put yourself like in your house, and take it, but try to take the same dose. You're probably going to be put through a little bit of a mental exercise for sure. I fucking hate tripping in a house. Not my, my I favorite. don't mind it. I like it because it's a little bit. I like it because I can go out into the heat and really feel the heat, like feel the presence of the UV rays and be like, I'm hot. And then go back inside and there'd be nice. And it's just a whole new feeling, right? Like, I say that, yeah. I mean, Austin and I have had some great trips indoors, especially the time he broke a glow stick over my face. And uh, oh, I didn't remember that story. Oh my god, just lit, lit me up, you know, like a candle, Christmas tree, whatever. Yeah, there's been some good trips inside, but for <laughs> sure, I prefer I, being outside. I was, I was. Uh, have you ever seen James's staff that he has? That oh yeah. Lights up? Oh yeah. So. <laughs> 
we were at we, not too long ago, right? We were having fun tripping. And we were in the backyard, and I was just playing with it. We were all in the back, and you know I have a vinyl fence. Mm-hmm. And so I took it, and I just started – I swung it like a baseball bat. Well, for whatever reason, half of it snapped off, and I, it snapped off at the perfect time that it rocketed straight through the vinyl fence. <laughs> Out across the, the the street to the neighbor's yard. <laughs> I just, you're just standing there like, no, what just happened? <laughs> yeah, I felt so bad. <laughs> I was like, oh, no more glowy staff. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I did the same thing with my crossbow. Oh, what? <laughs> <laughs> no, it turns out chickens are tricky bastards. Your neighbor. Sorry, Janet. Sorry, sorry. It's okay. It's okay. I'm not a gang member. Um, <laughs> so, in other news, hey, Abby and I are thinking about moving up north. I'll tell you about that. North Dakota. Mm, maybe South Dakota. Wyoming. Just, so fucking hot here, man. I feel so bad for my grass. Remember how you were walking me through like how to water grass, make sure it gets deep roots, all that stuff. Yeah. Do we haven't seen rain here in probably like six weeks? Oh yeah, y'all Maybe. been having a heat heat uh, surge over there, haven't y'all? Dude, it's been intense, like a hundred yeah. degrees every day for six weeks, and like I'm watering the grass. You know, I've watered it several times, and it and I go out of I go out there after two hours of watering the dirt to feel how deep the moisture went nothing it's clay it's just the my yard is peeling away from the foundation of the house there's a two inch gap at the base of my foundation between the dirt and the cement do you have i've never seen that before do you have grass at all is it dirt now just straight dirt no i'd say like half of it's alive it's just kind of annoying because it's like here in texas uh energy is really cheap but water is really expensive. And right now, because of the drought, they have like water restrictions going on. How close they pay attention to that. Like whatever, they probably just charge you more. Get um, that, uh, get that. Well, I guess you haven't had rain, but I mean, maybe get a uh, water uh, rain collection bucket going. You know how fucking pissed I am for not doing that? So here's, here's the issue I take up with having a spouse that you love and care for. Okay. I'm a man that loves to do things. Too many yeah. things. I love to do things and I get these projects and now I have to prioritize. Dylan, you remember when I was a single man? It was great. You came over. We just did shit all the time. How Christy put right. up with it? I don't know. I don't know. Cause she loves you. You love her. She just gave you the time. Gave you the time. You know what I gotta do now? I gotta watch Netflix. I can't do shit. <laughs> it's not true. I can do plenty of things. But that is why I've gotten on my high horse this past couple of weeks with getting dialed in with my scheduling is because yeah. I've realized my soul needs projects. Yeah, and you have to. Well, I mean, how you do it is really you just you just start annoying her. You just start staying inside. It's impossible. You, you she start, likes me too much. I don't oh, know what to do. Oh, there's a point. <laughs> yeah. Find it. <laughs> Gotta find it. We all, we all, trust me. I've been at a point where I've been like, I've got enough, Colton. I'm, I'm ready to go home, mm, get out of this mm. festival time. You know, that that point yeah, typically sure. occurs when I've had enough of myself. And there's, and I know you've had that with me. You're like, it's time to go home, Dylan. Time, to and I'm like, I get it. It's time to go. Yeah. See, but, but there's a difference. You just want to have too much fun. I love having when, fun. I love when. And and when you when I say have too much fun, you just burn. You just burn, baby. I've seen it's a supernova. (laughs) You burn way too bright. It's like magnesium on fire, son. That shit will melt through a fucking table. It's like I find the black hole and I say, let's go through it instead of maybe hanging. You don't chase the dragon. You catch the motherfucker. And I'll tell you what, sometimes just not down (laughs) with that. So when my switch gets flipped, I go from I'm having a blast to if I'm not having fun, no one's having fun. Like, I don't know why that comes out of me. It just, it's, 
pissy poopy pants party and I'm over it. I'm done. Full shutdown. I, lo- I love when we're at heels. a festival too with a group and everyone, when you start getting that pissy push moment and I tell the group, either you with that pissy poop <laughs> moment or you're with this good time, which way are we going here? And they're like, oh shit, we have a choice now. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and I, Hey, I'm very plain Jane. Everybody knows when I'm just over it and I'm like, Hey, this is what I'm doing. I don't care. I'm not attached to anybody else's agenda. I just know what I'm doing at that point. Right. Like that, I get a singular focus. Mm, Which I mean, as you should, right? Like it's whatever you come to, to the comfortableness. So like this past Okeechobee, every people started going to sleep and I was like, or we can go party on top of the RV with everybody else that's doing it right now till seven. Again, a very solid option. Very solid like, option. And then the group split. And then the people that did go to bed came out because we kept them awake anyways. But anyway, I'm excited to find out what happens at Burning Man here. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Well, that, be, that one's fun because that's a, that's a pacer. It's going to be pacer. interesting. We're going to be two miles away from the camp and we're going to be like, now we're tired. <laughs> Got to get now back. We're t- well, I looked into those little electric bike things. Not a bad deal. Like 70 bucks a day, 60 bucks a day. I'm down to go for that. Definitely you know? down for that. And they deliver it. That's not, that seemed like a really good, good deal. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I'll look into maybe buying one. I don't know the utility of having that after Burning Man. I mean, not unless you're trying to. I feel like it would be better. I don't know. You're in Austin. I, it might be better if you're trying to get around downtown. Like if you and Abby wanted to go downtown for a bite to eat or something, it might be nice. Right. You'll get a lot of right. rain, so you don't have to worry about much. But then you have to make it. Hey, back to the rain thing. The point that I brought up with there is that if you're listening to this, look up in your local um, town, city. It's a city for Austin. So they have a a city rebate program. And I was going to attempt this when I moved here in the fall. Um, It's the same thing I I did in Tampa where like energy programs and like whatever, they have all of these programs that people just don't take advantage of. So when I got all that free insulation, I got like two thousand dollars in free insulation, weatherization, all these had, like grants yeah, and stuff. I had Duke come out. I had him come do a full report check on my house, make sure everything was buttoned up. They do it for free. Yeah. Then they it send for free. You, then they send you free stuff afterwards. Whole like, bunch of free shit. They literally go, "Thank you for using <laughs> this service." I don't understand how they incentivize <laughs> that, like, like what the incentive is for them doing that. But what I do know is that the city of Austin has like a water capture program where they'll give, they have like a couple of different like stages to it or whatever. But I looked it up. You can get, I guess what they transport, like canola, canola oil, like cooking oil or like things for like restaurants, like those big yeah. plastic tubs or whatever. Yeah. You can get one of those. People are just selling them on Craigslist for like a hundred bucks and they're mad. They're like 500 gallons. And so you get that for a hundred bucks, you get, um, maybe like a couple gutter diversion things, mm-hmm. a couple screens and an automatic pump. I mean, you're in it for like 400 bucks, but 500 gallons, I don't know what 500 gallons in peak seat drought right now. Mm-hmm. You use that, what, three or four or five times and it pays for itself. Yeah. And then you got it for life. Right. So Pretty good. that was a fucking idea. And you know, here we are. Um, you know, I got my ground opening up. I thought about not too long ago was, uh, you know, are you still doing the cold plunges? Yeah, yeah. fuck yeah. Shout out to have, Kevin. Do you have a machine set up at your house or do you just do ice bath? The the gym I go to is awesome. It's called Squatch and they have a spa, a cold plunge, and a um, whole bunch of re- other equipment. That's awesome. So the reason why I brought it up is because uh, Rogan actually advertised the company that he uses. And I looked mm-hmm. it up. Of course, the one he has is badass or whatever, but they have pretty mm-hmm. inexpensive ones to where you flip the switch and it just freezes all the water for you. Mm-hmm. you turns it on. It's not even that expensive. I was like, that's pretty sweet. I'm thinking about getting one myself. Yeah, my boss Rob has one. He uh, It was a sponsorship for his podcast. It looks like a really nice porcelain tub. Yeah. It's kind of like a modern. Is that the one you're talking about? Yeah. Like you a just, modern looking. Well, the one that he has. Yes. They had a mm-hmm. cheaper one. It was, it looks like it's kind of more of like what you go into after football practice, but you know, it, they have it, you know, as, a, as an That's option. That's what they have at Squatch. They, they, I mean, well, they basically have two horse troughs next to each other and they put some like foam squares. They have, they made a nice little like bench kind of thing around it and they, what fucks me up is they just put straight ice in that bitch. They got like a filter that keeps it running. It keeps it circulating instead of getting moldy. So from having the one in Tampa, I had a kind of elaborate setup there. It wasn't expensive, but I knew the temperature. 
So I was like, hey, 46, 47, that hurts. They just dump ice. Yeah. So like some, you don't know what you're going to get. Like this morning, there was a little bit of ice. You know, it kind of looked like a McDonald's cup been sitting out for a couple hours. You're like, still cold, still doing the job. <laughs> Day before that? Good analogy. No ice. I was like, this is like a cold shower. This is nice. Yeah. What gets me is some days I show up and it's like a Zaxby, Zaxby's cup with, with no water in it. And you're just like, I mean, it's got a little bit of water, a little yeah. bit of water. Dude, how cold is that? I don't know. That's like 34, 35 degrees. So you but, get this range. But isn't that good, though? Because then you don't have the same temperature. In a way, it's good. I'm not saying it's good every time. But in the way... I think it's great. Good. I think it's great. you have a different... Your body's never getting acclimated to hitting that temperature. Your, yeah. your mind's like, okay, I know I could stand 34 degrees. But the next day, 40 degrees, because it's different, might feel... I don't know. I don't know if it is. Might feel colder just because it's a different temperature that your brain has. We're to also doing this after a workout too. Do you remember the difference when we did our cold shower challenge? Yeah. If you worked out or if you didn't, very different. Um, I liked yeah. them after workouts. It was like cooling my body down. It was like Joey, right? My roommate. He would take mm -hmm. cold showers before going to bed because it calms your heart rate down, and that's what he. I did. feel like that would accelerate your heart rate. I thought the same thing, but it's the hot water. That accelerates your heart rate. He took no shit. a quick cold shower, like a quick cold shower. Okay. Uh, like dipped his head in. Sometimes he got all the way in. And then yeah. uh, it would cool cool his body down, slow his heart rate down. And then he would just be up for a little bit reading and then pass out. And that's how yeah. he relaxed was his cold showers were before bed. I was like. We're doing oh. ours quick. I'm actually, I got a little bit of earache coming on. I have to get some of that alcohol stuff. But um my buddy Kevin, he'll he'll vinegar. come on the podcast here soon. Um, yeah, vinegar, it'll help. I've been using this stuff. I got bad ears. Anyway, um, we just do it basically for the mental benefit. So we're in there for like 30, 40 seconds because at the end of the workout, we've already spent an hour, hour and 15. We got shit to do. Yeah. I tell you what, there's a lot to be said for just having somebody that's consistently, we're showing up, working out together and it's like, knowing that that's just part of his routine i was like hey man i don't have that much resistance to doing it the first couple times it's always sucks but then once you're just in a pattern you just hear what i love i used to voice the first like uh, a week or two ago i used to voice the voices that were coming up in me like the the little internal bitch that starts yeah. playing yeah. so i just externalized it because why not he thought it was fucking hilarious so I get in this ice tub and I'm starting screaming about hitting an old woman in a, in a grocery store for some reason. I don't know where this stuff comes from, but it, it comes alive in me. And I'm like, man, I just want to knock out an old lady in a grocery store right now. <laughs> and, uh, you know, we're in 30, 40 seconds, maybe a minute, something like that. It, we just stay in until you feel comfortable. And then you're like, okay, I, I conquered. I conquered something. I can't wait to have my own. But like, you know, when you finally get that house that you settle, you're like, I'm going to be here a long ass time. Like, this is where we'll be. I cannot wait just to get the sauna cold bath like i'm gonna get the whole thing so that way i don't have to deal with the people from you know i go to crunch i love the sauna there but it, again you get variations some days because sometimes people are going in and out of the thing so the heat doesn't have time or you got people that are taking up all the space so you can't really you have to stand I find the ones that like chains like that it, it doesn't quite ever like it's very seldom you get what you're after the like one, that ideal experience. The crunch I'm at is pretty good. The the new one that I went to is it, that one's doing good. It's just some days. I'm just like, talking about the temperature because you got people coming in now. Like yeah. that's what I'm talking about. Yeah, that that I'm a I'm a cookie cutter bitch when it comes to the sauna though. <laughs> <laughs> I make no qualms about it, man. I don't. Did you know about, that in Finland? I think it is. There's like two million people. No, yeah, no. There's six million people, but there's like two point five million saunas. Is it Finland or Sweden, you think? I think Sweden. Maybe. Maybe it's Sweden. Yeah, I, I think Swedish sauna is a thing. But they have, like, that is a thing to the point that they were saying, I was reading it, that, like, some people are born in saunas. Like, that's how many saunas there are in Sweden. Did you know there's a bunker for every person in Poland? Really? You want to fact check that for me real quick? Yeah, I think um, I was, <laughs> I will. I was listening. Yeah, I thank will you. Fact check it now. I was uh, <laughs> listening to a podcast the other day, and they were talking about that um, from the Cold War era. This is really funny. So, quick, like little rabbit hole here. 
the Mormons have a lot of preppers in their community. And so this is where, who was the guy, the climate change guy that was a Mormon? Do you remember his name? Um, the climate change Mormon? I don't remember. Ted, I don't, Ted Cruz is a Texas guy. I'll think of it in a second. Anyway, so there was a Mormon in the cabinet when we were going through the Cold War, whoever the president was for that. He was like in the president's cabinet advising him that like, hey, we got to prep for this, all the bunkers. So like, remember when like bunkers used to be a thing in American culture? It came yeah. from like the Mormons supporting that movement. So like the Mormons have like this big like prep, prepper, doomsday, apocalyptic culture kind of thing going on. And um I mean, it kind of makes sense. They're a cult, so. I don't know that... what that was about, but I, I just remember hearing that stat that, like, for Poland, every every uh, household has, I think they have capacity for 110% of their population in bunkers, and it was state-sponsored, whereas in the USA, when we were going through that, the government built bunkers basically for the government, and the people had to, like, privatize the bunkers, and be like, big fuck you, but... Um, well, yeah, one of the countries, many, how many fake mountains are there in America, but they're actually bunkers, you know, how many of those are out there? Well, you think about like North Korea, you know, how much we survey them for the worry of nuclear arms. Yeah. There's kind of like telltale signs for finding nuclear bunkers. Oh, that's where it came out of in the podcast. This guy had renovated the tubes for the, Poland um, only has bomb shelters for 3% of population. I right, will look it up. June look 24, up what, June 24th, 2022. A couple of population has it for, uh, for all of them. Um, anyway, this guy like renovated the nuclear missile silos. Yeah. And like is selling the levels. I've heard of right? that. I've heard of so that. that's where the conversation got sparked out of yeah. was, uh, was that movement. But I just think that's trippy. It's like, Hey, would you want to live in a missile silo? Would you want to live in a bunker? Will we ever get a cold war again? Who would knows? you want to live in a bunker during a cold war or like during a apocalypse? Like, would you really want to go fallout style or would you want to just say, I don't want to live through that? That's a good question. I mean, how hard are we talking? You know, are we talking like global annihilation? It's Finland, I mean, by I the mean, way. I mean, you're going to have to live, you're going to have to live in this bunker probably a good two years minimum because the radiation, and everything's going to have to die back down. Before you can come out of it. I mean, if we're talking like what, how many nukes go off? All right. So I was reading an article not long ago where I guess this person back during the Cold War, there was a fault in Russia. They saw a false alarm, right? Mm -hmm. Said it was like five nuclear warheads coming from America. And he actually saved the world from a nuclear holocaust because <laughs> he was like, that's probably not right. Because he said... He thought, because he was over the button, he was like, if America was sending nuclear warheads, it wouldn't be just five. It would be a ton of nuclear warheads coming from America. So he was like, that probably triggered. He got, a, I forgot his name, but he got a ton of like awards from the, from like the world of like all the nations for like being like, thank you for not. There was a, there was a couple close calls. Are you talking about, I'm sorry, I was looking up that stuff. Are you talking about the guy from the submarine? Uh, I don't know if he was a submarine or not. I just saw that, like, he had a, he, he could have. From Russia, he, right? Yeah, it was just something from one of the satellites was triggering, uh, a, a light triggered. Yeah. Saying there was uh, nuclear warheads coming from, from America. Mm -hmm. Anyways, that just told me, like, okay, that's interesting that he says that because then if there is a massive war that breaks out, you're right. It, it probably would launch and hit every major city. And then every major base and every major. So think about, okay, for example, right? Tampa, they'd probably have one hit McDill and then they probably have one hit Tico. Bam, bam, boom, boom, hit both of those. Cause then that knocks out the plant for all of. It'd really just be one. I mean, McDill is close enough. Like you, you just need one. Well, McDill takes out McDill. They have their own power plant, but then it takes out. What I'm saying, Tico as the power plant is there would probably be a they would hit probably every major power plant in every major city. So New York mm, has not from a strategic own. point of view. I mean, if we're gonna break this if, down, like you're if, just you're just going for the the base. You're not. If not I really if worried go, about well go, during 
Well, when I went to Tico to tour it, they have military presence all around it. So you can't get on the property without a military person checking your idea and why you're there. And they constantly have Do you think they checks. hold that up for the nukes? They're like, oh, hey, hold on. Can you just... I need well, to during see some ID the bomb, before you blow us up. During the bomb threats that were hap- that happened, I don't know when it happened, but there was like bomb threats for Tampa. And it was clear that they protected Tico during that time. Like they were putting stations around Tico to watch to see if something was coming. They hit mm. it. And so obviously yeah. McDill, that's the number one. Like if, if a base is going to be attacked in America, the first one is literally McDill Air Force Base. I don't know about that. It's central comm. Uh, it controls all the war that's been going on that happens in Europe or Russia or Iraq. All the captains and all the decisions come from McDill Air Force Base. Really? So, so I, I took know. a tour of it. You go inside and there's central comm. Mm-hmm. And they got think of like uh almost like if you think of like the, a NASA launch station. Right, they got the big screen and stuff. They have them up, and they can literally, if if a guy is in a war zone, they can pull up his camera, boop, put it up on the screen, and go, "Hey, we need you to make this decision. Go left, right. He's in that room." Mm. When they're controlling all the like, the the uh, the airstrikes over there, the guy is at cent- <laughs> over here at McDill controlling it, and the guy to push the button is there in Central Cop. Oh yeah, that is a that's it right there. <laughs> right there is where every, all the decisions. Well, are. one of the, one of the places that we're eyeballing moving to is Denver. And, um, I love the conspiracies around the airport there. <laughs> yeah, I look for, I cannot they, like, get enough of it. They really like doubled down on it too. They're like, but I can't remember if the bunkers were like for the government agencies or if the bunkers were all about like, uh, do they, do they have a pretty big military base in Denver? I don't, it's I would pretty central so. America. So I would assume. Yeah. Well, I would assume so. I w- because you have, uh, well, New Mexico, right, has the white sand. They have the white sands and all the nuclear testing, the nuclear strike testing, and that's where all that happened. Mm-hmm. Well, just south of Denver is where they actually built the nuclear bomb, right? So there's probably definitely stuff all around Denver because it's out in the middle of nowhere. One of the fun facts I was going to bring up on nukes real quick, there was a proposal um, I can't remember if it was proposed by the guy that invented the nuke or not. I don't think it was to put the codes to the launch uh, nukes next to a man's heart, next to a volunteer. And so it would be the president's responsibility if he wanted to launch a nuclear strike to have to cut the codes out of the man's chest. And it'd be volunteer, but it was to like drive home the severity of like, hey, if you're going to launch this nuke, People are gonna die. That's and, an interesting uh, way to like, like you you gotta be willing to take out this person face to face before you go killing off a bunch of like airship. The thing with that though, like I get that, I get that. But then the thing is, if it's a, about seconds, you know Putin ain't gonna give it. <laughs> Come here, buddy. Bam, <laughs> you're done. It's not about seconds anymore though. Like we're we're so far past now that we have hypersonic uh, nuclear tip missiles, it, we're, it it's so far. Like if Russia launched a nuke right now, I think it would take a minute and thirty seconds to get to DC. Yeah, I was reading some of those. We went to the submarine museum at Pearl Harbor while we were in Hawaii, and looking reading some of their like new submarines they're building. It's some of those mis- I was like, holy cow. Like, the submarines are huge, and now these things are standing straight up. Like, you know how torpedoes, right? This way? Right. They're building this submarine that's like three-story building high, and then there's a, a warhead inside that sucker. That just any time. It just circles the planet, just ready whenever we need it. Wait, you mean the width of the submarine? Is that what you're talking about? Three stories? Yeah, tall? Like, tall. Right. Tall, right, right, that's right. how yeah. tight, tall it is, and then it's just a warhead sitting in there like this. And all it takes is, and they showed like this is what how it launches. Do, 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 do. Oh, those gone. submarines roll heavy. They roll with like eight or twelve of those motherfuckers. By the way, the ones yeah. that have the the nuclear missiles, it's not just one. They roll heavy with those <laughs> things. Re- ready to go. 
There was like a whole bunch of stuff out there about how those, like a couple of the subs have gone down, at least one of them. I can confirm that one of those subs has gone down. They had to go back and retrieve the nukes. And same thing with other nukes that were in transport in a plane, a plane fucking went down and they had to go back and retrieve those. Um, Imagine a pl- how did the warhead not, oh, you have to arm it. That's right. Yeah. You gotta arm it. The, yeah. But the fact that like America alone at one point had 34,000 nuclear warheads in Russia, I think had something, something equivalent, 40, 45,000. <laughs> That's why we're always on edge. Like ever. the Russia's fact like, that eh? we didn't have another couple of nukes go off <laughs> is beyond me. I mean, just think yeah. about the amount of like ego involved in global politics and war. And it's like, I guess we found a line. The humanity is clear. Like, hey, yeah, we don't want to fuck with that. But well, it's I think it's impressive. all the. It's probably all the little countries that are like, hey, 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 guys, guys. Let's, let's calm down. Let's keep it. I mean, sure, but like, it's like Pratt and it's like Pratt and Dinosaur World, where he's like calming down. Well, the funny part is, like, war now is like all about information and data. You know, like cyber attacks. Yeah. Well, that's why China's so, rocking it. They know what's up. They dude. know how to do it. Killing it, man. You gotta give them credit. They know how to steal ideas and attack you for it. I was listening to all this shit about TikTok. You heard about like how uh, TikTok or yeah, TikTok's different in China than it is in America. Did you know about that? Yeah. We, well, yeah, because they have their own internet, so that makes sense. That no, like the algorithm's quite literally different. So oh, in China, they yeah. show the kids like scientific achievements, like athletes, like. Well, Stuff I that makes encourage them to be better. Well, I think it was you that was telling me this, and I and I talked to to Christy about it the other day. She brought up a good point. She was uh, the TikTok commercials out now, right? It's mm-hmm. all like, look what I learned, look what I learned, look what I learned. I think you, I think you were the one that told me about it before the pandemic. The TikTok was really like dances and like, hey, look at me. But then TikTok got smart and realized everyone's stuck in the home. They want to show a way. They so that what they did was they had their their top influencers here in America push how-to videos. Here's something mm. I like to do, guys. I like to make this bread. I like to make this pie. Or here's how I like to clean things. So then, And then what they did is they used their algorithm to push those types of videos up. And so they were like, oh, let's turn into a how-to thing here in America while everyone's stuck at home. And everyone did all this cool stuff. And then they're, they controlled the algorithm to push those types of videos. So... That's an interesting thing that you're saying that now with China, that that's the thing that they're doing because then they can control what happens in what country. Oh my God. Now that I think about that, that's kind of fucked. <laughs> that they yeah. Can, there's they a lot of social engineering happens. going on. The FCC you, yesterday called wow. on Apple and Google to pull TikTok from their stores because of the amount of data leak that is going back to China. So like, we th- this whole thing happened with Trump and Trump was dead on. He was like, "Hey, we can't yeah. have this." Like when he shut down Huawei, yeah, and um, that's why TikTok sold to an American company. But by law, the data is still required to be transferred to China. So like they sift it here and they send it back to China, and then China sends it back and is like, "Yeah, we didn't do anything with it, whatever." So that's what they yeah, were trying to make a U.S. division, right? And that was why they were trying to get like. That's why Microsoft or somebody was going to buy and create a U.S. division. Mm -hmm. So it had to go to here first before going. Right. Anyway, that's kind of interesting because then if you do that and you control a large population of young people, what they think think is important. Think about a senator's kid. Ain't no way you're keeping a senator's kid off TikTok. You know, they're 12, 13. They want to be like their friends. They want to make cool dances. They want to be a part of the trends, whatever. Who knows what kind of data that they can mine by being able to like trace, you know, just figuring out stuff. Like what are the locations? Like who knows what kind of data they can scrub from the phones if they're on an Android versus a well, Have you iPhone. seen the guy that, uh, that he pops up on my feet sometimes where he'll go, they'll go uh, f- locate where I am based off of this picture of sand. And he literally goes and just, lo- he, he like finds all the different types of sand in these different locations or it'll be like based off of this picture. What do you, mm-hmm. where, where am I? And he does. The, like competitive Google Maps guys. 
Yeah, and they go, boop, boop, boop. Okay, this is based off of this street sign. That type of street sign is the lighting of the sun, the trees. He's facing this way, and the light's coming from this way, so it's a northeast. Mm -hmm. And and it's just like, yeah, so imagine. And he does it in like 20 seconds. So imagine all that data that they're pulling that they can easily, if they get a center. I mean, think of that though, too, is the center of sun, but then like Hunter Biden's posting like pictures of crack and <laughs> crack photos and stuff and his laptops out there in the world somewhere. And then China's just like, we don't even have to try with this guy. But like, it's just funny that you say that because yeah, they literally can control what, young people think is important for like a mm. whole 10 years. In a, in a well, one of, one of the Facebook engineers was commenting, I have cat hair all over this mic. So sorry if that creates interference on your end, but um, <laughs> jelly bean got all up in this thing, man. Um, one of the Facebook engineers, I believe was talking about the way that TikTok's algorithm is winning. Cause personally, I really prefer TikTok over like Facebook or Instagram, like kind of like Instagram. But I love TikTok. I can just spend fucking hours on TikTok unchecked. And the way that it was Gary Vee, actually, I think was the one talking about the way they chose to grow their algorithm was not based off of social influence. So like when Facebook was coming up, it's because, hey, we're all in high school. Let's connect, whatever. I want to see what you're up to. You're posting this. Cool. We're friends. I don't know about you, but like a lot of my interests and my friends from high school, it's like totally different, right? So we evolve. So our interests grow apart. But now I'm still connected to that network, so I'm not as like drawn to their interest anymore. TikTok pushes purely based on interest. So that's why so much of their content gets repurposed is because I think like 10% of your followers will see your videos and 90% of it's just new. TikTok's just looking like, what are you interested in? And they'll just feed you more of that interest instead of feeding you what your friends or what your friends are interested in, whatever. So they just push you down your interest rabbit hole versus putting you down the rabbit hole of like what your friend group is doing. Well, it, well, here's the thing. Interesting that Andrew Schultz talked about this the other day, right? So he's met with a lot of like high tech people because he wanted to be on the platforms that were really going to push his stuff because he's, he's grown on Instagram. Dude's exploded. And YouTube. Well, what he wanted to do is he asked around like, hey, what platforms are going to be used with the algorithms would be best? And they told him YouTube. Uh, clips and Instagram because Google controls the algorithm, right? Google's algorithm is better than TikTok's. Even though TikTok is huge, yes, they don't have the presence and the type of money and funding that Google has. And then you have Instagram, which has is of course controlled by, or sorry, Alphabet, not Google, uh, is controlled by Meta now and their presence and platform. So TikTok is going to be good, but the problem with TikTok is they're just pushing. They're just pushing, 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 pushing. Google's algorithms and Meta's algorithms for Instagram, and what they do is they push the content that's actually good is what he was saying. Like they know their algorithms know how to find the information that's actually good. And if it's shit, they're not going to push it out. So for example, right, actually uh, Christina P with, your mom's house loves curating TikToks that are just off the rails, right? They're just like, but they don't really, they're not really going on people's timelines, but she's curated her algorithm to find these like weird ass things. Some weird shit. Yeah. Some weird shit. And they're great. I love listening to her. Yeah. But that's, uh, but my point to that is, is that she's seeing this and these people are getting like thousands of views but then they're like, they're nothing. They're like, why are, why is this getting thousands of views? Whereas like Instagram and Google's like, uh, YouTube clips, if you're approaching shit, it's not going to get viewed in a way. Now, TikTok, of course they're coming up. We all know they're, they're blowing up, but this is what he's been using over time. A good, uh, I, you brought up the thing though earlier with, uh, was there a point to that? I'm sorry. No, I would, there wasn't. I didn't, okay. There, there wasn't. Right, I got sure. off on just a, a huge rail of a tangent there, but, um, a good podcast to listen to that you were talking about earlier from, from what you were talking about with Facebook mm-hmm. to, to where it is now, where like it's completely different. Listen to uh, uh, Mark Zuckerberg on Lex Friedman's podcast. They kind of talk about- You got that. Mark on there? Yeah. Wow. A while back ago. It was a good, because he talks about that where he goes like, this is what we used to be. 
Um, and then today, like we had to grow and morph and he talks about like the future of social media, what kind of where it's going towards. He's, you know, he goes, I understand Facebook's kind of going out. Like this is where things are kind of going in the direction they are. So we're just yeah. morphing to it. And he, it, it was, it was an interesting podcast cause you actually got to, it was the most comfortable I've heard him in an interview because Mark Zuckerberg usually doesn't like doing them. And he right. was actually talking with someone as like as like intellectual as him. I guess on, you yeah. I, yeah. At a Lex, level. I don't know if it, he must've had some kind of platform before getting on Joe Rogan, but I feel like he just did an amazing job capitalizing on his exposure from there. And it's like, he, he wasn't a micro influencer, but it's like, he didn't have the weight that a lot of these people did. And he was just pulling on massive guests. I mean, he's had some well, incredible think, people on his show. Well, he's, he's, he came from the AI world, so he was already influential in the the AI space as someone that was mm. coming up and knows how to understand it and the, the the study of it. So he already was in with like high level scientists. He pro he already knew like high level people in Google, things gotcha, like that. Gotcha. So he already knew those types of people, and he already had a platform going. And then he gets on Joe, and Joe pushed him further to be like, you should push your podcast. He's a really smart guy. I mean, he is like a, he is kind of a robot himself. He, you know, he's kind of like a, his jokes are so dry, but like also so funny. Cause he's such a, he's such a monotone person when he's talking. <laughs> so funny. <laughs> when we go out to burning man, we should make like a hit list of, uh, you know, we should make like a manifestation list of people that we want to run into. Let's make a bingo. <laughs> yeah. A bingo yeah, okay. card of the people I, we run into. I feel like we could be standing on top of a dragon head, and all of a sudden I look to my right, and like Theo Vaughn is right next to me, just chilling. You never know. <laughs> you know. You never know, right? So I, I think that'll be a fun thing to do there, because like, yeah, man, it, it's just trippy when you get around the space of people that either one you like idolize or look up to, and you realize they're human. It's such a cool experience, but also I've had these like weird synchronicities over the last week, where. For instance, Michael's in the Philippines right now. I don't know if you knew that. What? Dude's having the time of his life over there. Yeah. Awesome. And um, I've been having this like really interesting draw towards meditation, manifestation again. And I love when the universe does this like synchronicities. I get think about something. Five minutes later, that something happens. You get an email or a text or whatever. And that happened the other morning. I was talking to my brother, Kel, about this. We were having a good conversation about God. And... I was like, I wonder what Michael's up to. Woke up and I was like, I wonder how Michael's doing. No shit. Five seconds later, dude texts me. Hey man, miss you, buddy. Hey, should I get scuba certified? And I'm just like, what the fuck? You know, like that's just I've so that trippy. Happen. I've had that happen before too, where you just think about somebody and like 10 minutes later, they're asking how your day's going. You're like, something happened. Right. I'm sure. Right there. You know, I don't, I don't even know if that's what manifestation is. I just feel like it's a signal that you send out. You know, uh, from from you, and they just end up picking it up somehow. Well, it's a it's a real documented thing that science has tried to explain. Like when Thomas Bell invented the phone, it also was invented a couple hours later in France, I want to say, and it was just a race of whose system is going to get bigger sooner. And yeah. so they they have these experiments they've set up where rats on opposite side of the world will be shown a maze, and and they'll do it time and time again where. When one set of mice figure it out, the exact same maze, the ones on the other side of the planet figure it out st statistically, significantly statistically faster. That's just oh. trippy. So they like have these controls. They run these tests. So there's a there's a term for it, especially around inventions, where this has happened multiple times, like not like at nauseum. ACDC. Yeah, right, right around the same I, time. I, I, I was it right around the same time? I don't know. I, I think yeah, uh, were, Edison's DC came first, and then Tesla looked at that and said, uh, I can build it better. I think it was the opposite. I think it was the opposite. Do you know the Biltmore house in uh, North Carolina? has? <laughs> it's a huge, humongous house. It's wired. It, it was at the time where uh, it was those both. they were both competing, and this family was so rich, they were like, ah, just wire the house, AC and DC. We don't know which one's going to become popular. Just, really? Just wire the whole house, AC, DC. Yeah, the whole entire place. 
That's so trippy. Remember that really shitty electrician I sent to you? Um, that guy, man, when he came out of my house, he did a good job at my house. But that was when I learned a lot about the ACDC thing. I was trying to figure out um, what the problem was with my stove or something. But my house in Tampa was originally wired DC. They had like the ceramic, um, I forget what they're called, but the, like they put them in the corners of the room and they just pass the live wire through the wall. So it would just be a hot wire just running. And so it was like under the crawl space and in the attic and stuff. So it's just like, dude, you just got however many volts just pumping, baby. Just pumping through around the house. You're like, this house is really warm during the winter. It's nice. <laughs> or have you ever seen videos of like electricians when they're, they'll go to do an inspection at a house and they'll be next to a power grid, like the big uh, A-frame things that are, you know, the heavy duty power lines. Yeah. They'll just take out the gauge that they use to read inside the house. So, like, I forget what it's called. It's a pin. I use it to detect if I have, um, like, incorrect wiring or whatever. It just test faulty stuff. It's a pin. And so you don't have to, like, physically touch the exposed wire. It'll just tell you if it's live. Yeah. They can't, they can't use these readers when they're next to these really big power grids. Because it's putting off so much electricity. It just uh -huh. gives a false reading. So they have to use the, the actual nodes. And touch them to the wires to figure out, you know, what's going on. You know, speaking of power grids, I'd really like to go whitewater rafting up in North Carolina again. Because, you know, the reason why I said that is because a lot of those power grids control the rivers. <laughs> so that's what pops in my head right now. So I'd really like to go whitewater rafting. I was like, that's a natural progression. Sure. Yeah. I'm down. Maybe we can get some whitewater rafting in the desert. That'd be cool. Oh, we will. We need to get the. So we got to get the RV. We got to get the bikes. We got to get our mindsets. And we got to get. Got to get it all. All right, let's land this plane, dog. All right, folks. Well, hope you enjoyed another episode of the Professional Hippies Podcast. Share with your friends. Share with those that you love. Share it with yourself. Share it with your partner. Mm. Share it with those that you hate. We don't care. Just get it out there. Like, follow it. And uh, check in for the next episode. Peace.